Hello, everyone, and welcome to Knights of the Pages Library. We are a little podcast dedicated to reviewing audiobooks. I am Bo Knight, and I am joined, as always, by my brother, Ryan Knight. And today, we are taking a look at Gunrunner, written by Larry Correa and John Brown, and narrated by Oliver Wyman, the OG. Uh, yeah, and this one is part of the uh, Gunrunner series by Larry Even Correa. there's only one book. There's only one, and then I think there's also another little short book. It's like only two hours long or something. That oh, Lost Planet Homicide is part of this? Okay. I, I did not yeah, I believe that. so. Yeah, yeah. So, um, But as far as I know, those are the only two in the series so far. Um, so yeah, if uh, if anybody has anything to say about this or uh, anything else that we have done or that you'd like to see us do, please feel free to email us. kotpl.pod at gmail.com is still the easiest way to get a hold of us. Um, and the only thing that we would ask of anybody listening right now is, uh, you know, one star, five stars, thumbs up, thumbs down, whatever you think we deserve. Um, just, uh, just let us know. <clears throat> and with that, let's uh, let's get into this one. So we listen to this book at Audible. Um, it's been a minute since we mentioned that. Um, most of the stuff that we cover is going to be through Audible. And if we listen to it somewhere else, we will definitely be sure to, you know, announce that on the podcast. Um, but so I, I if you Gunrunner is only available on Audible too. I, I think yeah. they might have locked down on Larry Korea's whole library. I think all of his audiobooks are only available on Audible. Oh, sure. Okay. That very well could be true. Um, yeah. Gunrunner definitely says only from Audible. But so, you know, we're just saying if you, you know, found some random person who recorded this on YouTube, uh, your mileage might vary from what our review is going to be. So yeah. <laughs> just keep that in mind. Um, and so let's see, when did this book come out? It's, it's pretty new, right? Uh, yeah, I believe the audiobook was released in 2021. That's what I'm so, seeing. Yeah, that's what I'm seeing too. Yeah, right around the last couple of years. So this book's pretty new. Um, and <clears throat> I mean, so let's let's see. What is Larry Korea known for? Well, if anybody has listened to us at all, uh, you'll know that Larry Korea is obviously a big like sci-fi, fantasy, and fiction guy. Um, we've covered a lot of his stuff. We've done an entire episode dedicated to several of his series. Yeah, so, we <laughs> yeah, we've covered a lot of Larry Korea stuff. However, now, John Brown, a little bit more of a wild card. Um, first time I've ever heard of him. Um, his presence on Audible is much smaller. He only has a few books on there. Uh, looks like one series and a couple other things, but it looks like he is also kind of known for stuff like this sci-fi and like fictional books. So, yeah, yeah. Was it a match made in heaven? We'll find out. Yeah. Uh, so, I mean, the big question is, how did Oliver Wyman do on this one, Bo? I mean, he slays. He always slays. <laughs> Yeah, uh, we're a little bit biased because um, some people might know. Oh, you think just because I've talked to the guy, I like him? <laughs> we uh, we had Oliver on on our show, and we got to talk to him in our person. Our one and, and only guest so far. Yeah, and uh, that was awesome. And we still really appreciate him doing that for us, um, especially, you know, we're this teeny tiny little podcast in the corner of the internet. So it's awesome that he agreed to be on with us. Um, but it still stands that he is one of our absolute favorite narrators by far. Um and this book is no different. You know, he uh, he keeps the performance level high uh, throughout. His characters are always spot on and his voices are always spot on. So yeah, he does an excellent job. Yeah. Um, I mean, I would hazard to say he even brings this book up a notch for me. Yeah, so, I, I would. I would say there are definitely a lot of characters. I think that he does like a really iconic performance for. Sure. Yeah. So, <clears throat> I mean, again, kind of goes without saying, though, if you're if a book has Oliver Wyman as the narrator, oh, it's yeah. probably yeah. going to be pretty good. Yeah. Buckle up because he's going to do a good job. Yeah. 
Um, yeah, so <clears throat> the genre of this one, kind of like I already said, this is definitely a sci-fi book. Um, this takes place in space among different planets, some stargates, some stuff like that in there. So if that's if that's your thing, you know, you might be kind of into this one. Uh, it's got aliens. It's got big robots. It's got all that kind of yeah, stuff. Yeah, I would definitely put it as like a mecha kind of thing. Like sure. That's definitely a big through line throughout. Yeah, it definitely comes in, um, especially in like the later half of it too. That's like a huge selling point of it. Um, this book is pretty long, clocks in right at 18 hours, which is um, a really, you know, that's pushing the, the like really long in my opinion. Yeah. Uh, I mean, I guess I can't speak. I like Game of Thrones, which are like 48 hours. So, right. And absolutely. And when I say, when I say that I think it's <clears throat> long, um, I've said this before. I think right around 10 hours is the sweet spot for a book, usually, um, unless it needs more, like a Game of Thrones where it's literally just like world building every paragraph. Yeah. Um, it, it can always use more. This book, I don't necessarily think it needed this much time, in my opinion. <coughs> Could have been a lot shorter. <clears throat> yeah. So, um, Sorry about that. yeah. <clears throat> so, spoiler warning, perhaps. However, uh, yeah. So, this book. Let's see. What's the cost on this one? I'm gonna guess twenty seven ninety nine. Well, let's see. Oh my goodness! Why can't I find it now? Of course, it's not like the first one on this list. <sighs> why did I why did I click on Larry Korea's name? Why wouldn't I just click on John Brown? It's a much shorter list. Oh, there it is. $29.95. Uh, $29.95 for this one. Um, and we've mentioned it before, you know. Uh, you could pay that price, but I don't know anybody who would pay like the full price for a book these days because you can either get it for free with a trial, you can buy the tokens, you get free tokens every like month when you sign up for like the Audible Plus or Premium or whatever they call it these days. So I don't know. I don't know. I mean, I guess I've bought a couple books outright on Audible, but I usually I, I wait till they go. I, I only do it when they go on sale. Um, which here's a tip again. I'm I've mentioned this before, but if there's a book that you even think you might like. Put it in your wish list because it'll notify you when it goes on sale. And a lot of those books might be normally like 30 bucks regular price and they'll go on sale for like $2.50. So that's a huge deal. Yeah. Uh, okay. So now the big questions on this one. Is this book easy to follow? I mean, yes, but I think only because I am so familiar with like Larry Korea's writing style. Sure. And I'm okay. I'll leave it at that. This one <clears throat> to me, it's pretty straightforward. Um, there's a couple of character changes here and there, um, but not a lot. So it doesn't necessarily get confusing as to like who's talking, who's doing this, who's doing that. Um, it's pretty straightforward in that regard. Um, I just think there were a couple parts where I kind of zoned out because it almost was taking too long to say what it had to say, in my opinion. Yeah, I I think this book is a little overwritten. Like there's sure. a little too much writing. And sometimes it seems like the descriptions kind of get into stuff that is not important, if that makes sense. Yeah, like, like a little it makes bit, sense to me. Yeah, like, like over painting the scene, essentially. Like it doesn't, there's a lot of stuff that's like, okay, but why mention that? Right. And I mean, it is, it is a very highly descriptive book, but again, I think that almost, it's almost to its detriment because yeah, like you said, there's, there's just things that might not have needed to be so overly explained is all. Um, then as far as easy listening goes, uh, again, it's an Oliver Wyman narrated book. So of course it's easy to listen to. Yeah. Um, and like I said before, I think that his narration actually stepped it up a notch for me. So really, you think this is like a better performance than he normally does or do uh, you mean to step the book's quality up? Yeah, that's what I mean. He brought the book's quality or like the books. If I was going to give it a score, he added points for that. You know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah. I <clears throat> um, but yeah. Okay. So on to the real big question. What's your recommendation on this one? It's a hard no. 
I really enjoyed this <gasps> okay. one at all. <clears throat> okay. I found it to be very meandering. The payoff is not very good. And I have I don't really like mechs that much. It's I and, and like the, the suspense and build up around them for this whole book. I feel like the payoff is like such a wet fart of like a final confrontation that they have. Sure. And and the the whole like spoilers, the whole oh I'm Jackson Rook and I'm never gonna psychically jack into a mech again. Like oh okay. You immediately know what's gonna happen with that shit. Yeah, it's just I, like, I yeah, I just didn't find it and I found like the whole maybe like the first half of the book to to have like almost nothing to do with the rest of it. Like there is so much like building about like the like Captain Holloway and his ship and stuff that doesn't matter at all. It's just like a lot of fluff for no reason. Yeah. I I just found it to be so meandering and I and it felt really generic to me too. Like it didn't it didn't feel like there were new characters of Larry Korea's in this. It felt like he just borrowed ones from other books and just put them in this one. Yeah, even with similar names. Exactly. Exactly, <laughs> dude. And I, he has a type and like a, you know, like his hero type always kind of has a, like a type and I'm okay with that. But like the supporting cast just felt so generic and like sure. the, the, the bad guy, I even put that in quotes, like didn't really feel evil. It just, no. I don't know. He felt more like an opportunist than like an evil person who like needed to be stopped. It was like, oh, well, I, there's a class struggle going on. I have nothing to do with it, but I'm going to get involved. And and that right. even comes in so late in the story. Yeah. And it's like, what the fuck? Like, I don't know. I, I found this to be so meandering, but what did, what did you think? What is this, is this a good book? Would you recommend this? I, there were parts of this I liked, if I'm honest. Um, but again, it goes back to, I just think it was a little overly drug out. Um, and like you said, there was a couple of things towards the beginning of the book where they're like, <laughs> they just like that. They just keep harping on it. I will never do this again. Yeah, I do. But they bring that but, up so often. They, yeah, you're they like, bring, of course you're going <laughs> to fucking do that. Exactly. Exactly. They bring it up so many times that I immediately was like, well, it's going to happen again. I, I mean, yeah, it's like... <laughs> Yeah, um, I, I don't know. It's, it all felt so generic. Like, and I think that ultimately was what disappointed me so much, especially when <clears throat> some of the setups, like for you know, Big Town, where they're orbiting the planet Swindle, and then how Swindle is an extremely hostile planet. I was like, oh, cool. I want to hear more about that. But they immediately were like, nah, we're going to talk about something else. I'm like, yeah, no, that's like, we're going to talk about this city that's in a tube. It always feels like you're walking uphill. (laughs) It's like, who cares? Yeah. I was like, no, I want to hear more about Swindle and the, yeah. The the things that are on Swindle. Like, that's cool. I I feel like any of the topics that would have been really interesting, like exactly like you said, even the mix, they danced around them for so long that the payoff i was just like yeah okay. yeah it's like it's like, like me it's like this is literally death on legs this thing could kill a whole planet it's like cool but yeah. you're not gonna get in it for freaking 16 more hours holy shit yeah like, that's it yeah this this was one of the few books that in quite a while i found myself actually like while i was driving um i'd reach over to my phone and see how much was left because i was like when is this getting over i was like i was like like especially like that first half like kind of after the prologue i was like okay but how much is left right yeah it just it felt like there was like they were trying to set up a lot of things um but they didn't really know where they wanted to go with them i felt like they just like went in all directions at once yeah, and then by the end, they were like, oh, okay, we got to rein it all back in together yeah, somehow. Yeah, they're like, oh, what is this book actually about? Right. Yeah, which is unfortunate because I think it's really good, <clears throat> uh, excuse me, subject matter. And, like, I'm into this stuff, like sci-fi, aliens. It's like, a oh, stuff's cool. setting. It is. It's just they squandered it. Well, and some of that stuff, to me, like a mech fight or, like, a mech fighting an alien doesn't translate well in a book and to me like it really doesn't 
you know, that's that's like cinematic stuff that I like to see in movies done well. But it feels like in a book, it's just not interesting subject matter. And I, I, I know Larry Korea can make it interesting because I'll listen to freaking 12 books about a dude with a shotgun shooting zombies in the face. <laughs> I will sure. listen to that. Yeah, but like, absolutely. I, I don't know. Like, he needs to quit doing collabs, man. Maybe he that's just, what it is, yeah. Stop. Yeah, because I feel like most of his books that he's done with other people are the ones that we harp against. Yeah, the they were like, oh, the book is terrible. Right. Yeah, and I we don't know, you know, what the amount of writing from either side is, but either way, you know, his name's on it, so we're going to obviously have to assume that a lot of it or some of it or most of it is from him, so. yeah. Um, but yeah, I mean, I, I guess I really danced around my overall recommendation. You gave this one a hard no. Yeah, it's a I, hard no. It, unfortunately, I, there are parts of this that I like, but I cannot recommend somebody sit through 18 hours of this book. Yeah. Um, that's, Wait, that's, no. yeah. I mean, I guess if you got nothing else to listen to and you're like, I really need a new sci-fi book, maybe, but I I think there's better choices out there, you know. Go back and listen yeah. to our Starship Troopers episode. Yeah, dude, freaking check out some HG Wells or shit. <laughs> yeah. Um, so yeah, um, there you go. That's the uh kind of general summaries on this one. We'll go ahead and pass the spoiler wall now and we'll just kind of talk about the book. I don't think we're gonna go through this one necessarily beat by beat because we'd be here all night. Yeah, um <laughs> we, we don't have nine hours. Right. But um, if if for some reason you still think you really want to listen to this one, then please pause this, go ahead and go listen to it, and then come back here and hear what we have to say about it. And yeah. feel free to email us and let us know what you thought. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so with that, um, I like the beginning of this. Uh, I do too, but I feel like they do a bait and switch because I, I thought this book was going to be about Captain Holloway. Yeah, same here. Same here. I'm gonna be honest, um, yes. way more interesting than Jackson. Way, yeah, way more interesting of a character. I agree. And okay, so you got Holloway shows up on Gloss, right? Yeah. And he's there delivering weapons because he's a gun runner. And basically, what he does is he brings outside weapons and stuff in. And for this, is are they in like a revolutionary or civil war on Gloss? Is that what it is? I, I think it's like the people fighting against the corporation that controls gloss. Oh, okay. Like Google or something. Y- yeah. Like <laughs> Go- so Google's controlling gloss and the, 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 the workers had an uprising and essentially okay. what captain Holloway is doing is like the, the corporation has like a, like a moratorium on selling weapons to like the people who are doing the civil war. So he's like going around that to make sure that they can fight back. Right. Yeah. Um, and so part of the uh, the people of Gloss that he is supporting, he brings up uh, this Jackson Rook, who is a mech pilot for the Glossians fighting against the uh, corporation. Um, and he kind of just talks about this kid and that he's like really young. He's only like, shit, what is he? He's only like 14 or 15. I think he's 14. He's, yeah, he's super young. Um, but the idea behind this is, is that uh, Jackson is outfitted with like uh, stuff in his brain that allows him to control a mech using his mind. So he basically can run a mech like he's like, it's his own body. Um, And and that ability to do that is very, very rare. Like it's not common that people are able to do that. Right. Because a lot of people that they put that stuff in, it just kills them outright kills them. It, It just kills them or they're not like, you have to be like, your body has to be compatible with the parts and your you mentally have to be compatible too. So there's like two components that have to go right. Right. Yeah. <clears throat> so shortly after Holloway shows up and he delivers whatever he's delivering and he leaves or he's getting ready to leave the, this corporation that gloss is fighting against figures out how to hack those things that are in their mech pilots and essentially forces them to turn on each other and yeah. on their own team. And Jackson is among them who turns against his own people and basically slaughters his own people. Mm-hmm. Uh, they call um, it slave wear. Yeah, they call it. Yeah, exactly. Um, so 
But before Holloway leaves, he gets a transmission, right, from Jackson that he's still alive. Yeah. But he's, at, he, he's basically asking someone to come kill him. And he, uh, like, I, I do like this, that he, like, essentially had enough control to, like, dose himself to kind of, like, inhibit his mental abilities so they had less control on him. Right. And so he's so he's he's able to like break away from it for like a moment. Yeah, enough time to get this message out. And so Holloway takes his uh, I can't remember what they call her, a specter. Is that what it's they call specter. her? Yeah, that's right. Jane. Um, so he takes a specter Jane with him and they go find Jackson in the cockpit of his destroyed mech. And they basically Jane goes in and puts a block on his slaveware so that it cannot be accessed at all from any sides, essentially. But they um, don't explain that yet. They they just they like, oh, hopefully we can save Jackson and they move on. Correct. Uh, and so that's the end of the prologue is them rescuing Jackson. So then we jump to it's like, I don't know, four or five years later. Right. Mm -hmm. Um. And we jump to the Tar Heel, which is Holloway's ship. And that's the ship that he uses as his smuggling ship. And they are basically on a different planet. And now they have a mission. And Jackson works for him and has been working for him this whole time. And we essentially switch gears here because now we're not following Holloway at all. We're following Jackson. Mm -hmm. um, and... This is the part, right, where Jackson is, they're going to steal this Citadel mech, right? Uh, I mean, this first part is him, like, swiping a jewel, and, like, that guy cases him, member because they stole a bunch of his animals. Oh, yeah, that's right, because then they get into a bunch of shit, right? Like, yeah. in the middle of the street, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, which that guy and comes up at the end, right? I feel like I the overriding comes in where they talk about, like, like fucking setting up all these backstories for him and they they talk about these backstories like he gets like three different ones and they talk about like who these people he's supposed to be are for way too long like yeah way, so way too long like oh you like butterflies and all this shit like oh i don't yeah. like butterflies well too bad that's who you are now it's like what what why like well, who cares he's just putting on a fake identity also um why why have a time skip to then go back and like play that game of like like he met this dude right in the street and this guy had a problem with him mm -hmm. but it was something that was skipped over in the time skip yeah so it's like exactly. why are you like, now trying yeah. to go back and fill in the time skip why didn't you just make that part of the story yeah it is kind of weird and that guy does um, come back yeah he comes back towards the end of the book um and then he's rescued by uh, by Tui, right? Tui gets him out of there. Mm -hmm. Which Tui is a freaking awesome character. He's like the head of their security, big old like Samoan dude. Yeah. And he is a good character and he's a fun character. Um, and again, I think that Oliver brings him to life. Like he does. I, I can picture this guy with even just with the way that Oliver does his voice. Um, <clears throat> but so that's right. They uh, Tui rescues him. And gets him to where he needs to be. And basically, he's he's supposed to steal this mech, right? Which is in a container. I'm picturing yeah. like a regular looking shipping container because that's how simple my mind is. Yeah, that's what I was picturing too. So. <laughs> um, so basically, Jackson gets in this container and he gets in this uh, mech, which is called a Citadel. It's a fifth gen. Yeah, a fifth gen, which we as a listener have no idea what that means. We just know there was four gens before it. Yeah, um, top of the line. That's yeah, liquid we, armor. Right. We will find that out as we go. That yeah, fifth gen is basically the newest one that they're on. Um so he pulls this little kind of bait and switch thing where he gets in the mech and he gets it out of the container, but the container continues to where it's supposed to go, but he also put a bomb in there. So then it floats away and it explodes, which gets all the you know security's attention and stuff and they go check that out and mean meanwhile he gets the citadel on board the tar heel right yeah i mean there is this little bit of him like not having enough oxygen so he's like barely awake yeah but i feel like that was sort of just filler uh, it is it is <laughs> <laughs> cuz it yeah it didn't really like i don't know it didn't really have anything to do with anything i mean i oh, guess no, it's it sort of building jack building jackson's character but um, 
So he gets this thing on board the Tar Heel and the Tar Heel's like, okay, yeah, we weren't part of any of that problem that just happened. So we're going to leave now. But as they're approaching the warp gate, uh, security's like, well, uh, you've been selected for a random inspection. Mm -hmm. So they think that on the Tar Heel, they're going to have to jettison all their goods because the only way to not get caught somehow in space, no one would see that you just threw all your shit out the side of your ship. And they'd be like, hey, what about all that stuff you just threw out right back yeah, there? Yeah, <laughs> that made no sense to me at all. No, right? That You can't jettison stuff in space and not expect them to be like, hey, what was oh, that? Yeah, where did all that shit come from? <laughs> You're the only ship around. <laughs> yeah. um, uh, long story short, though, they uh, I can't remember her name. The the Shade? What? Oh, I, Grandma? They call, her, they call her Grandma. Uh, yeah, yeah, I can't remember her like, name. She's like super old, but she has so many augments that she looks young. That she looks young. Yeah, they don't know her actual age. They, I think they mentioned that she could be upwards of like 80 or 100 years old. Yeah, she could be super old. Yeah. Uh, but she calls in a favor and the random search gets called off. Um, so Shade is also the one who set up the deal for the Tar Heel to bring the Citadel to this next place. And I and I, she, I think she sets up all of their deals. She has like a lot of like shady she's like, background stuff. Yeah, she's like their broker. People. Yeah, broker. That's a perfect way to put it. Exactly. Yeah. She's she's like the one that sets up all this stuff for them. And like immediately, the book is like, mm, "What's she up to?" Mm, elbow nudge, elbow nudge, elbow nudge. Yeah, and I did not appreciate that at all. No, dude, it's okay. so fucking stupid. Well, and it's such like, a like it's what, just a what's, red what's herring. The robot lady's name Jane. But she's yeah, she's like, Jane's like, ooh, I noticed these little bursts that Grandma's sending out. Almost nobody be able to detect them except for me because I'm a master hacker. What's she up to? It's so, yeah. I don't know, it's so dumb. And it's from, like, the get-go. Yeah, and we as the listener know, like, we get the conversations of who Shade is talking to, but obviously the crew doesn't know. And we very quickly find out that who Shade is talking to is not who they are currently taking the Citadel yeah. to. Um, so what they end up doing is they go to a space warp gate. Uh, the book spends about 20 pages explaining how space warp gates work in this. Yeah, I hope um, you love that because it's not going to come up again. Yeah, no, and I was, yeah. I mean, that. yeah, that's cool that, yeah, it could launch you out into a random spot in space and you could just be screwed. Um, but they spend so long explaining it for it to not matter at all. Yeah. <clears throat> um, so they go through the space gate and they show up at this planet called Swindle. And Swindle has this space station that orbits it, right? That's big town, right? Yeah, I, di I didn't think of it so much as orbiting it as it being like kind of close to close to the surface, but not like all the way down. Like if that makes sense, like okay, not sure. quite in space, but like a like a you know like I don't know like a freaking like an airship would be, kind of uh, like yeah, off the uh, ground. Okay, but sure, I can that's see how that. I pictured it, but maybe I'm picturing it wrong. I, didn't I just think of it as like a space <clears throat> station. I was only assuming it was a space station because of the sheer size that they mentioned it. I mean, it's essentially a city. So yeah, it is. It's like a big tube, essentially. Right. <clears throat> um. Yeah, and they bring that up a lot. Yeah, all the time. <laughs> Every All chance they get, the time, yeah. So they're not. They're gonna remind you that it's in a tube, and looking up, you're seeing skyscrapers. Whoa! Right. Um. So when they get there, they immediately meet with their client, Warlord. That's all he is known as. Yeah. Which? Come on. That's like a first uh, draft name. Yeah. Yeah. It seems like you probably should have workshopped that a little more. Yeah. Um. They even kind of make fun of it in the book because they're like, that's all, that's all he's known as. <laughs> Which is not an excuse. Like if I, 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 like if you know that something is not good enough and you make fun of it in the book, I feel like it's not enough. Like you knew you, you yeah. could have done better. Y yeah. Um, it sort of is telling, though, to how his character is, though, in the book, because people would be like, oh man, Warlord, that's sort of like cool, but it's also kind of goofy. But that is exactly how his character is in the book. Yeah, like, that is true. He's built up as like this, like you said, a hardcore, badass, like ruthless guy. But that he's really doesn't, not. 
Yeah, that doesn't come across at all. He's just like a businessman. Right. And he's really um, not even that evil. I didn't think so. I mean, I didn't think so either, where they're like, we got to <clears throat> kill him. It's like, well, I mean, like, what he's doing is like what people already do to us in the world. Like, that's what corporations do. Right. Like, plus, they're not <laughs> that bad. In this situation, too, like I get it. So, and a little bit of this ex- is explained. So, after they land on <clears throat> Swindle, uh, we get a little bit of uh, they interact with Warlord and then they go, he puts them up in Big Town in the city. And then we get this other character, Fane. Oh, can we who, talk about the pool for a second? Uh, once, said, let, me fin- let me finish my thought for one second. Uh, so, Fane is like Warlord's right hand man and he follows them around. And the only reason I bring this up is because while they're in big town, they get some like uh, hints of like uh, uprising from big town against warlord. And they see like those videos and stuff of things like the kids being killed and whatnot on swindle. That's the only reason I wanted to bring all that up is because that's how they're trying to paint warlord as being like a horrendous person. Yeah, but he's not killing them. They're dying to like the local fauna. Right, which we'll bring up again here in a minute. Uh, so yeah, please talk about the pool. I I don't understand. They spend so much time talking about this pool and like how everybody wants to go in it, and they bring it up so much. Like, oh man, hopefully I'll get a good go in the pool. It's, yeah, I is I was I was like already annoyed immediately. <laughs> I was just like, stop talking about the pool. I don't yeah. care. Yeah, I agree. It's, yeah, that one guy, it's like all he wants. It's like, oh man, I'm just gonna go to the pool. Will my wristband get me into the pool? Yeah. <laughs> um so yeah, I the thing too about like the way they're painting Warlord is it's like, yeah, he's he seems kind of like a ruthless businessman, but almost in this situation, and this is obviously a fictional situation, however. Um, almost better the devil you know than the one you don't in exactly. the situation. Like, I feel like somebody could come in and do way worse. Like, yeah, <laughs> because at least, which leading up to this part, uh, Warlord wants to take them down to Swindle to show them the mining of the CX. Which I, right, you remember yeah. what the stuff is? Yeah, it's like the inside of the tree bark that they. I, I think they like freaking refine it into like a drug. Is that what it is? Okay. Yeah, I was kind of, I was drawing a lot of parallels between Dune and the Spice. Ex- exactly. It is. It is a lot like the Spice Melange. Yeah. Okay. And okay. I know this doesn't come up yet, but I feel like if I don't mention it, like they have to use kids to get into these small openings in the trees right. to get at the CX. Right. Um. So Warlord wants to take, uh, he takes Tui and Jackson and like three of Tui's uh, security detail people. He wants to take them to the planet to go on a hunt to show them like what it's like down oh, on get tribal, dude. Yeah. So <clears throat> he takes them down there. They does Warlord get in a mech or does he just get in a? No, a they suit? get in the exos. So like the yeah. That's right. Um, but so this was the part though where I was like, probably better the devil you know than the one you don't because at least he goes down there and sees what's going on like he doesn't just fully expect people on the planet to do everything by themselves so yeah um so while they're down there they get attacked by these creatures that they call caliban um i still don't fully know how i even picture these in my own head um like the arachnids from starship troopers this is how i thought about them but that's not really how they're described i was i was much more underwhelmed even than that i was more picturing like pretty bog standard dinosaurs almost oh you were like freaking like triceratops and shit okay Kinda, yeah <laughs> i was picturing more like insect like oh yeah see i was picturing more of like a dinosaur or reptilian like creatures but so this just kind of establishes like what kind of planet Swindle is. Um, the air is toxic to humans. They You can breathe it, but it will basically ruin your lungs to the point where you will never breathe correctly again, and it will kill yeah, you in like, a short it, like, amount of time. It eats away at your like lining of your lungs. Yeah. Um, it eats away at their suits while they're down there, so they yeah, can't spend like, a whole lot of time like down there. Acidic. 
Yeah. Um, and apparently almost everything on Swindle, like all of the, um, the life forms on Swindle are extremely hostile. So, especially yeah, I, to humans. Yeah. I know you haven't played StarCraft, but I thought of them as like the primal Zerg that, that they talk about. Like they, they like adapt to their environment really fast and they're all very vicious. Oh, okay. Oh, yeah, that's a good way to describe them, I guess. Um, so while they're down there in their hunting party, they get attacked by these Caliban and the Caliban whip their asses. All right. Like just there's three well, of them. There's a giant one, I thought. Well, that, that one out. shows up. That one shows up right at the end, right? And we don't even know what this thing is. They don't even talk about it. They just say it's the size of a mountain and it snatches up one of the Caliban, which I'm picturing as like the size of a like a rhino or something. And it snatches this thing up and eats it. And in all the confusion, everybody else except Jackson escapes because he gets hit by one of the Caliban's tails. Yeah, it like knocks him flying. Yeah, it sends him flying out of the brush. Uh, it knocks his suit offline so everybody else gets into a ship and escapes and jackson's left down there alone um so when jackson comes to some of the caliban are still there like eating on the corpses of all the people who were laying around um he manages to escape he like sneaks off into the woods um then we find out how much like how bad the planet is right he gets stung by like those giant bee looking things like yeah just everything is hostile, basically. S wasps. I don't remember what they're called. <laughs> yeah, which I don't know. I mean, yeah, that's kind of a cool concept, but surely there has to be things that are not hostile that get eaten by the hostile things, right? <laughs> I, I guess, unless everything is just like a pain in the ass. <laughs> and which I, why? Like, so they're they're on this planet, right? Because of the CX. Yes. So, like, that's the only reason they're there. But like people are dying left, right, and center because of how hostile the planet is. Right. Doesn't make a lot of sense. Um. Yeah, and it doesn't. <clears throat> that's also where I have a hard time understanding this because I'm assuming the CX is sold on like a black market type of thing. Because if if no, it were... I think I think it, it's going right to a corporation, but they're like really coy about who is actually buying it all. Okay. Because I, I do think they mentioned that like the grandma lady talks about like that the, the supply of CX needs to keep flowing. Okay. Yeah. I, yeah. I remember that. The only reason I mentioned that though is because Warlord seems to not have like a ton of resources to deal with the creatures on the planet. You'd think he'd have like a ton of resources and they bring it up. Like he has like all these exos and he has a bunch of mechs like in his collection, quote unquote, that they yeah, we, we look just at past that part where he's like showing yeah. Jackson his spider mech, which is like another fifth gen mech that's supposed to be basically impossible to a pilot unless you like actually jack in with your brain. Right. Which is where we find out that the captain can, or not the captain um, warlord can also jack into a mech and run it with his mind. Mm -hmm. um, that, that's when he finds out that Jackson is also or was able to at one point. Um, so <clears throat> let's see. Oh yeah. So then Jackson, while he's on the planet, he sees another person on there and he proceeds to follow that person. Then he proceeds to get captured by other people. Right. Yeah. They like lead him into a trap. Yeah. <clears throat> and this trap was set by, are they called the originals? Is that what they call themselves? Yeah, that is what they call themselves. Okay. Also not a very original name. Uh, <laughs> oh was that a pun oh, kind of a really bad one but yeah um so the originals were the original people who settled on swindle right or first came to swindle yeah i guess they were there first before yeah. before warlord got there yes and for some reason they were like this planet looks great let's live here even though yeah, everything I wants to kill really us <laughs> they live on the surface too right Yes, yeah. So they take him into like a cave that's I'm assuming deep underground, but they don't fully explain how they are able to survive there. No, yeah. This is one part where I feel like there was no description. No, I, yeah, something that needed description, there was not enough. Um, anyway, they take Jackson in there and they explain to Jackson that Warlord's an asshole and he like took all this stuff over and he's like 
he's doing it illegally or whatever. They explain all this stuff. And they also say that he was a plant, right? Somebody sent him there yeah, to do put, it. Yeah. Okay. So there you go. We're, we're building even more stuff that won't get explained. Um, so they tell Jackson, basically they blackmail him and they say, you're going to go back to Warlord since he kind of trusts you guys, sort of. And you're going to steal the plans for the Citadel and bring them back to us so we can make our own. Yeah, and then Jackson's like, you guys do not have the resources to make these things. <laughs> like, you can't yeah. make them. Yeah, he's like, you're dumb. But they also implant this thing in his spine that if after a certain amount of time runs out or if somebody tampers with it, it will break and then it will basically melt his spinal column and will paralyze him forever. Yeah. So he's like, oh, well, okay, I guess I'll do what you ask me to then. Um, so he leaves and he finds a way back to, it's like the original spot, right? Where the Caliban attacked them is kind of yeah. where he goes back to, um, he ends up getting picked back up by warlords men and brought back up to big town. Um, and I'm skipping over a lot of stuff. Okay. Cause like I said, we will be here forever. If I don't, I'm trying to yeah. hit the high pool. I'm trying to hit the highlights is all they get back up onto big town. And, uh, Right. So Jackson has to try to put his little plan into motion without Warlord finding out. But the problem right. is, is Fane, basically Warlord's lieutenant, and Warlord himself are like, now nah, we know what he's up to already. <laughs> yeah. And I did we explain that like he kind of feels for these originals because like it reminds him of the the conflict that he was on Gloss. So he like just decides that he's going to help them basically like, yeah, even, even if he didn't have the thing in his back, he was basically going to do it anyway. Right. It's very much so like, um, that movie avatar, uh, oh, yeah, dude. kind of thing. <laughs> like that's what oh. it feels like to me. Oh, it's fu the funny part about that movie avatar is like, I root for the humans in that movie. <laughs> I, yeah. I, I, Oh, I don't like that movie at all. So that's very telling as well to this story. Yeah. Um, but yeah, so basically Jackson's like, all right, I'm going to steal this stuff. It's going to be no problem. And Fane's like, nah, man, he basically arrests all of them. Well, he arrests Tui and Jackson because Jackson Wait, is like, no, I thought they actually don't they get to be part of Warlord's crew. I thought Jackson, they like go to have that party and Jackson's like, yo, I could teach your dudes how to drive the yeah. next. That's what and I was. They, yeah, I was going to bring it up next. Oh, but yeah, you're right. Oh, OK. I, I thought they didn't lock him up until after that. They yeah, I yeah, I messed up the uh, order. But yes. Jackson is like, hey, man, I could stay here and train your guys to run these mechs because I'm really good at it. And Warlord's like, OK, sounds good. And shortly after that, because Tui also agrees to stay. So shortly after that is when they actually get arrested by Fane. Yeah, and Fane's like, I know what you guys are up to. <clears throat> yeah, Fane's like, I think you were collaborating with somebody down there on the planet because you were... You survived for like whatever it was. He was gone a couple days, um, you know, and on a completely foreign planet and you had no way of surviving on your own. And yet here you are. So what they decide to do is they are going to take Jackson and they're going to put slave wear back into him and reactivate it. Then they're going to send him in the Citadel back to where the originals were to wipe them out. That's they, they tell him their plan right away. It's like a double cross on top of a double cross. Yeah. The old quad cross. Yeah. He swore on the cross. It was a double cross. Yeah. <laughs> um, so, and then uh, the, one of the few parts too, that I really did like about this is when, so Tui is also like a very augmented human. He has a bunch of upgrades to make him stronger, faster, whatever. Um, well, he fights with Fane, and Fane is basically a cyborg, which is badass. It is kind and of cool. Fane kicks the shit out of them at every turn. Like they cannot stop this dude. And to be honest, I liked Fane almost as one of the characters the most. Yeah, Fane's pretty cool. Um, 
Bane also has this thing that follows him around that's called a Grendel, which is apparently from Swindle that has enough intelligence, though, to be trained kind of like a dog. Yeah. Um, it's like a super murder dog. Yeah. Um, and, and that'll come up later. <clears throat> but so basically to Holloway, like Jackson told Holloway what his plan was. And Holloway is like, you cannot do this. This is stupid. Yeah. And I You're will have dumb. no part in it. Yeah. yeah. So Holloway leaves Big Town. But the warlord is like, they should have already went through the gate, but they're just hanging out, claiming that they had technical difficulties. Mm-hmm. So uh, warlord is like, there's obviously something going on here. And does he make a phone call or was that other dude already on his way there? Uh, I think that other dude was already on his way there because he is where they got the spider from. Right. Yeah. Because ex machina, because something had to happen to stop. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Basically so to interrupt the, the Tar Heel. Yeah. So there's a space battle going on now, too. Yeah. So that pirate dude from the earlier that we mentioned that they ran into when they were stealing the citadel shows up in his ship which is apparently even bigger than the tar heel and it's he is also apparently a smuggler who brings stuff to warlord um but since they got bad blood that happened during the time skip they just like open fire on captain holloway's ship and try to shoot him down yeah yeah there's like a space battle that's really undercooked yeah very bad it like, seems so tacked on. Yeah. It's like if uh, if you saw... Uh, this is honestly what I was picturing in my head is like an old school naval battle. But instead of like where the ships come broadside and they're only like 50 feet apart and shoot the shit out of each other, they come broadside, but they're like two miles apart. So they shoot these freaking cannons that just go way over each other and way yeah. short of each other. <laughs> like very underwhelming. And then there's a part where they like hack the missiles, right? Uh, yeah, I think so. Yeah. I don't know. It's, there's all this shit going on with Jane. Like she's a cool character. Yeah, there's a, did we, did we skip the drop pods? The uh, stealth pods? Yes, I did. Cause it, that happens right before. Is it right before or right after they start fighting? It's like, I, I think it's like while they're having like their captain discussion, you know, of being like, I think ah, you're right. You, yeah. You're an asshole. Like, well, you're an asshole too. Then they, yeah. they're like setting up this thing where they have like these old stealth pods that can't be detected by radars because they have like cooling heat sinks. So they don't, they don't emit heat because the only way to see stuff in space is like what emits heat, which right. is kind of interesting, but it's, it explains it for way too long. Stuff goes wrong. They get picked up by a garbage truck it's yeah, yeah it's, it's, she hacks everything like oh, that's yeah, her dude. thing which she, also she really reminds me of milo i feel like she's just a different type of milo yeah and <clears throat> but the difference with milo is like milo is just a cool character like he he comes into a scene he's a cool character he leaves and that's fine there's there's nothing wrong with that she comes into a scene she does some cool shit and then they also have to drop these like Oh, but her background is because of X, Y, and Z, and yeah. it, it has to do with with W, X, Q, and it's like it, it really what? reminds me of that scene from Wreck It Ralph, where they're, where they're like either on that video game, or like she has the most tragic backstory of all time. Yeah. It's like that's really what it <laughs> reminds me of. Yeah, and it's it feels very tacked on, and it's not expanded on because I'm sure no. they want to write it into another book. Sequel but I just. Yeah, I I was not a fan of that. And actually, it's exactly sequel bait because that's part of the end of the book. Mm-hmm. Um, so yeah, uh, they get down to back to Big Town, and that, they're gonna try to basically rescue Jackson. So yeah, Jane ends up finding Jackson and Tui and Fane, and they get into a fight. And uh, Fane whips their ass again. He's just whipping yeah, everybody's she, ass. But she's able to reverse the slave wear on Jackson. So he's like able to control the Citadel under his own power, though. That's like the right. big win. Yeah. And she manages to cut the collar off the Grendel. So the Grendel attacks Fane and kills him. 
Yeah. And and Fane also kills the Grendel at the same time. Yeah, which, they murder each other. What's interesting, though, is the first time when they explain the Grendel and Fane, like early on when they explain their relationship in the book, and Fane kind of always says that the Grendel, like, it's obedient, but he knows it's only obedient because of, like, the collar and because he's, like, its master. I immediately was like, that thing's going to kill him. But yeah, it, dude, it's, it, so it's going to kill him. <laughs> yeah, I was like, they're, they're, they're showing their hand far too early with some of this stuff. It's almost as obvious as the next bit where Jackson's like, you know, where I said I was never going to, like, mentally link with a robot again. Fuck that. I'm doing yeah. that right now. Yeah. So he basically, he links with the freaking robot again and he and starts how tearing they, up big town. They talk about the medical system in the robot for so long, too yeah. long, way too long. Yeah. Man, if you could just get the medical systems up, I would be fine. Oh, Ooh, but I got your weapons online. Yeah. But what about the medical systems? <laughs> I need the medical systems. Oh, yeah. so annoying. Yeah, I agree. And this this is where I yeah, I honestly kind of tuned out the mech yeah, fight. Yeah, but this is the climax. I know. This is like and the, the sad big part mech is fight. I tuned it out though because like I said, I don't think this stuff translates that well to it, like it a book. It, it, it's it's like somebody's watching an anime and explaining it to you. Right. It's like, oh yeah, and then he punches him with a big robot. And it's like super cool and awesome, and it's you just gotta watch it, man. It's like, but but I can't watch it. I honestly thought that the way they did like um, this this kind of stuff in Starship Troopers was better. It, I really it, did. It is. It is better. Yeah, I think with like their suits and what they are doing and the way it's explained, I just thought it was better. I agree. Um. So yeah, basically of mechs anyway. Right. <clears throat> basically what happens is what we kind of all knew was going to happen from the beginning is Warlord and Jackson fight in their fifth gen mechs. They fight each other, you know. And I honestly though, the only twist to this is I thought that maybe Jackson would end up in the spider and Warlord would end up in the Citadel. That's the yeah, only <laughs> they do kind of like sprinkle in some shit in the beginning of like, ooh, the spider's like the most mobile mech of all time, but only somebody who could jack in like me, Jackson, would be right. able to drive it. They yeah, like, they exactly. They do sprinkle that into the beginning and they're like, man, the Citadel and the spider would probably be like perfectly matched opponents. They do do right. that. And I kind of thought too, like, oh, maybe he'll get in the spider instead of the Citadel, which is. It's just like a basic mech with two legs. It looks like a human. They they yeah, straight up say that. I, it just I looks like, like a human. A Gundam. It's just a Gundam. Yeah. I almost picture like Optimus Prime. Looks like <laughs> so, honestly, Autobots dude. Roll out. Dude, his face is what I picture on this thing. Oh, <laughs> I didn't even really picture I was picturing more like armor core, like no features. Oh, oh yeah. They should be way cooler than what I'm picturing, but for some reason just I just keep getting Optimus, Optimus Prime's Prime. face. That's hilarious. <laughs> No, you're probably right. They're probably much more like when these guys were riding it, they probably were picturing something way cooler than what I'm picturing. Yeah, just fucking Optimus Prime <laughs> fighting, fighting like a spider. So, yeah. <laughs> um. So yeah, they fight on freaking the uh, big town. And... Well, they end up in space, and I'm I'm pretty sure like the the spiders like thruster systems are messed up, and Jackson actually like slows them both down enough that they both won't die because they're like locked in like combat. They're like essentially stuck together and he like right. slows them down. So when they hit, when they hit the ground, they both, they both don't die. Well, he could have just killed warlord right there. Right. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, they both end up on swindle, right? Yes. They, yeah. they end up down on the ground on swindle. And uh, yeah, they end up in this area that was brought up before where there's like a giant kaiju in the water because uh, Larry Korea loves kaiju and I he can't does. quite figure out why. He um, loves kaiju and like like eldritch abominations. Yeah, which I'm don't get me wrong. I like eldritch abominations and I like big monsters. I mean, I do. But for some reason, like the kaiju thing, I just I don't know. Not not a big fan. Um. And, uh, yeah, they end up on the planet and this huge kaiju comes out of the water and it freaking kills 
Warlord in well, his mech, right? He no, Warlord gets out to shoot Jackson with a rifle. Oh, that's right. Yeah. And then the kid shoots Warlord. The kid shoots Warlord. Him. Yeah. That's but, I mean, right. Warlord has so many augments, he's fine. But the, yeah, then the kaiju shows up and it's like, mm, Warlord, delicious, eats him, and then like makes a sound at Jackson as if to say, another day, and just leaves. Which, what? Like, I know. What I, the I fuck? was like, <laughs> I was like, are you serious right now? I, what? yeah. It, it, like, you couldn't have written a bigger ex machina type thing yeah, in exactly. if you wanted to. Like, it would have been one thing if Jackson was like, oh shit, and he like got out of his mech and it got smashed, but he was able to hot. Like, that would have been more believable, but literally it says that they look at each other and the the kaiju just leaves him alone yeah, and goes back like, in the water. It just like, yeah, just like sinks back into the water and a bunch of bubbles come up and he goes away. Yeah. What? Seriously? Yeah, it's like, uh, okay. All right. Yeah. So then in the epilogue, like Jackson decides to stay with the, the people on Swindle and help them rebuild and like help them start processing the CX to become prosperous, I guess. Um, and and Jane like leaves him a note, right? Cause she got called away because she's one of the daughters of something. Like I, I don't even remember. It was so weirdly I'm gonna sprinkled be honest, in. I was so tuned out at this point. Yeah. Like, when will this end? Yeah. Oh end yeah. My for suffering. Sure. Yeah, um, then that's really unfortunate, to be honest, because, again, you have a, a really good performance from Oliver Wyman, and, like, I I like the stuff Larry Korea writes, but this just didn't do it for me. No, it didn't. He has much better offerings than this. Yeah, and maybe if this had been about 10 hours, it would have been a different story uh, as far as how I feel about it. But the 18 hour mark was just dragging it out for no yeah, reason. It was, it's, it's way too long. Yeah. So yeah, that's uh, <clears throat> that's pretty much all I have to say about this. You got anything else or should we stop beating this poor dead? Uh, <laughs> mechanical cow- horse? Mechanical Caliban alien. Horse. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no, I'm done talking about Gunrunner. I never want to think about it again. Yeah, and that's unfortunate because it's going to be a series, so we're going to see it again in the future, but I don't... Yeah, I was going to say, I don't necessarily know if we will take a look at it again. So, uh, with that, what are we doing next time? So, next time we are looking at Empire of Imagination, which is Gary Gygax and the birth of Dungeons and Dragons, so it's like a, a biography of Gary Gygax, so stay tuned for that. Yeah, yeah. Uh, look forward to more anime squires as well in the future if mm-hmm. that's something you're into um yeah and again you know anybody who's been listening we appreciate it so thank you guys very much and again don't be shy please feel free to email us and reach out let us know your thoughts we yeah would love to it would hear. literally make our month so <laughs> yeah for sure yeah and i think with that we will end this one thank you all for listening 